In the previous lecture, we looked at a way of defining generic functions. And here we have a generically defined function f. And your task in this question is to identify which of the following ways are valid calls to the function f. So go ahead and pause the video here and respond to this question on Gradescope. All right, so we know that this function f is generic for any type t because of this diamond t declaration that happens before its parameter list, right? So this is any type t. But there's an asterisk here in that whenever we use this function, t has to be the same anywhere it gets substituted, right? So let's think about this for just a moment. If we imagine this call to a, uh, with option A, where F is the string foo, that would mean that T's type must be string, right? And that would mean that when we substitute the string bar for B, it would also be string and this checks out. Right? So this seems to be a valid call to the F function based on its definition. Now, if we look at the next example and we think, okay, well, F calling this generic function t type for the a parameter, the first parameter would be string. But then we continue on and we think, okay, well, b has to be of type t as well. Well, t was string for this call and we're trying to give it a number, right? So this doesn't actually work out. b is not a valid call to this generic function. For a given call, t has to be the same anywhere we use it, right? It can't be, we're not saying any type t can be substituted here. Uh, arbitrarily, we're saying for a given call, T can be any type, but it has to be the same type anywhere it's used in that given call. So let's look at example C. So example C, T's type we can imagine being number in the call to F. And when we look at B's type, well, T being number there would check out, right? So these two types are the same. And we're starting to get a sense that if we say that function F is generic for any type T, then the first parameter and the second parameter just both need to be the exact same type. And that kind of makes sense when we look at the implementation of this. We're asking, is one of these values equal to the other? So of course they need to have the same type. They can't be different types. So we can quickly uh, rule out the next fu uh, function called f because t would need to be number in for a, but then that wouldn't work out for b. And lastly, uh, with two Boolean values, t's type would be Boolean and this would work out for both parameters, all right? Uh, and this would be okay. All right, so now that we've uh, reminded ourselves a little bit about generic functions, we should ask ourselves if we can make a generic filter function, right? So in the previous two examples we worked through today, in the first one, our filter function worked on a list of numbers. In the second one, we had a filter function that worked on a list of strings. Each of them used their own specific predicate interface that was one well, dealt with strings, the other dealt with numbers. So this seems to be, again, a problem of repetition. And it seems like in the way that we looked at generic functions being able to get us out of this bind before, we should be able to use generic functions again to have a single filter function that works for any type of list, as long as it has the correct type of predicate to go along with it, right? So these two ideas are gonna complement each other and we're going to bring them together in the next example. So first we need to understand what a generic functional interface is. And this should hopefully start to feel a little bit familiar at this point. So we're going to uh, say that the interface predicate is generic for any type T, once again, by adding the diamond syntax after it, just like we would with a class. And then what we can say is, okay, uh, this parameter for item can be any type T, right? And in this case, that means we can have a predicate for any type. Like we could have a string predicate where the item parameter would need to be a string or a number predicate where the item would need to be number, right? So the concrete type of our predicate will be decided by the function uh, implementation. For example, something that is a function of type predicate number would be any function that has a number as its first and only parameter that returns a Boolean. Same idea with a predicate of type string would be any function that has a single parameter of type string that returns a Boolean. So why are types important? 
Well, again, they communicate the expectations and capabilities in our programs. And if we think about the following two variables, think about an item of type number and a test of type predicate number, that means that we can use item and test differently, right? With item, we can add it to other numbers, we can uh, subtract it from other numbers, we can store numbers in the item variable that we've set up. With test, we know that this has to be a function that takes a parameter of type number in this case, if it's a predicate of type number, and returns a Boolean, right? So we could call test as a function, and we can pass it as a parameter to other functions that expect a predicate, right? So what we're gonna do next is try and make a generic interface for, uh, for the predicate functional interface, and then we'll try and use that as part of a generic filter function, such that we have one filter function that will allow us to filter a type of or any type of list as long as we have a matching predicate. So let's open up the O2 generic interface app and follow suit through some of these to-dos together. All right, so just to walk through quickly what we have here, we have once again an input list of numbers. We're filtering that using uh, this filter function that is specifically only working with nodes of type number or lists of type number and a predicate. Our predicate definition currently is not generic. That's what we're gonna try and improve. Currently it expects a number hard coded in. And we filter that using the is positive uh, predicate. And I've defined the predicates on just one line. I've, I've condensed them here so that they don't take up too much space in our example. But notice we have an is positive predicate that takes a number. And then we have uh, things that look like they should be predicates, but currently they're not because our, our predicate interface is not generic yet. Uh, but if we had the ability to have predicates of type string, these two would, would fit that bill as well. So the first thing we wanna do is make our predicate interface generic. So we're saying this is a generic interface for any function uh, where t is gonna be the type of our first and only parameter, right? So a predicate for any type t is any function that you give it an item of type t as the first parameter and it returns a Boolean, right? And so now uh, these three functions would actually satisfy this functional interface type, right? Is positive would be a predicate of type number and is three letters would be a predicate of type string, okay? So now that we've redefined that interface, notice that's given us a problem that we need to resolve down here uh, in our filter function. If we wanted to make this work, work based on how it's implemented, I could fix this with uh, one quick change, right? So I could say, okay, test must be predicate of type number specifically, right? So you give a filter a list of numbers and a predicate that can deal with numbers and, and test whether or not they should be included in the list or not and we'll give you back a list of numbers where only those that were uh, that satisfied this test or passed it by returning true after being called with it uh, are included in the output, right? But what we'd really like for this to be is a generic filter function that works for uh, nodes of type string or Boolean or, or objects. So we should rewrite this to be a generic function. Previously, the steps that we looked at to do that are first we add our diamond T syntax to say, hey, this is going to be a generic function and then anywhere we had the specific concrete type that we wanted to make generic, we would substitute it with that type placeholder. Right? So for example, we're saying we want a list of any type node T, a predicate with a generic type T, and we'll return to you a list of node type T. And notice now our types still work out, right? So if we give filter function a list of any nodes of type T and say that T is number, then we have to give a predicate of type number as well, right? And so there's a correspondence here, just like we looked at in that last, in the, in the challenge question to kick this video off, because when we make use of this filter function, we can only have T substituted with one type for any given call to filter. If T is number, if we give it a list of numbers, then we're gonna have a predicate of type number and we're gonna return a list of numbers. If we gave it a list of strings, we would need to pass a predicate of type string that could test a string, and then we would be returning a list of, of, of type string as well. Right? So now what we should be able to do is uh, we can still filter, and th this example should still work. So I'm gonna save my example here and, and just convince ourselves that this still is valid. And now look at what we're able to do. This is pretty cool. We're able to filter with that exact same function a list of string values, right? And what are we gonna use as our predicate? Well, we're gonna use a predicate 
such as is three letters, which is uh, going to return true if the length of our string is equal to three. Right? So that should return a list that has the word the in it and the word fox in it. And sure enough, that's what we see in our output. Uh, and if I were to actually change this is three letters to be starts with B, which is another uh, predicate that we've defined down below and I save, notice we've got brown as the only word in this uh, sequence of strings that starts with the letter B. And we've got one filter function defined and a few uh, predicates defined. And notice we're able to filter, apply the same algorithm to lists of two different types, right? We only have one filter function here that's gonna work generically for a list of any type. And we can plug in only the logic that we want to in order to make use of it. And this is pretty cool. Like this is a pretty big idea because now we're not gonna ever need to go and redefine this filter algorithm once we have establish the uh, implementation of it and understand it to work for uh, generic lists and predicates, right? So one other thing I wanna convince you of that is still happening in the background is, is this still has to make sense, right? If, like we were looking at earlier, if T can only be one type for any given call to filter, right? So if it's string for the list that we give it, we gotta give it a predicate that's also going to be of type string. So we can't use a predicate say is positive, right? So is positive is a predicate whose type would be a predicate of type number, right? Just implicitly that's what it would be. But if we wanted to make it explicit, I could have said predicate of type number, right? So is positive is a predicate of type number. And notice that when we try and use it here, it's telling us that an argument of type predicate number is not assignable to where we expected there to be a predicate of type string. Right? And why did we expect it to be a predicate of type string? Well, again, when the programming language is trying to figure out, well, okay, we're, we're gonna call this generic filter function. The first thing you give me is a list of, is a node of type string. So T must be string, right? And what follows then is I, you, you have to give me a predicate of type string, but here you're giving me a predicate of type number. So this isn't going to work, right? But if I used starts with B, because that's a predicate of type string, which I could also make explicit if I wanted, but it's implicit otherwise, uh, this checks out. Similarly, with this filtering of numbers, I can't use starts with B here for hopefully what is now a, a, pretty, meaning, a, a pretty straightforward reasoning. Like starts with B is a, a string predicate but we need a number predicate in order for this to make sense, right? And this is what the error would tell us. It tells us argument of type predicate string is not assignable when we expected there to be a predicate of type number, right? And be, why did it need to be number? Well, the first T that we substituted here was going to be a node of type number. And so this needed to be a predicate of type number for that to make sense, right? And of course that has to be true because down here when we actually go to make use of that predicate, right? And we're testing the first value in this list, we expect to be able to give that test predicate function a value of a specific type, right? So if we have a list of numbers, the first value is gonna be type number and our predicate is gonna to need to be able to handle that and process it uh, correctly, okay? So I can say uh, is positive here to fix that error and we're back in shape. So this is one of the big ideas in computer science. We're seeing algorithmic abstraction here. And once we have this algorithm, the details of exactly how filter works are not really the concern of someone who's trying to just write a program where we are taking some input data and filtering it down to only the, the data points that meet some criteria. Once we have a filter function like we just saw, we only need to specify a simple predicate which will be just the logic we wanna test each item with. And we don't have to go write that complex recursion or any loops in order uh, to apply that abstraction algorithmically to some problem we're trying to solve. When there are values that a function needs uh, in order for it to do its job, we would introduce data parameters. And what we're seeing today is if there's logic the function needs or some process, we're going to introduce function parameters. In filter, that function parameter is the test logic, right? So we could have implemented the bouncer algorithm. In fact, that might be a good thing to just jump over and do really quickly. So how would we implement bouncer? Uh, well, we could have a predicate that is lit uh, is of age be a 
number predicate where our age is some number parameter and it returns a Boolean. And the implementation of this is just return age greater than or equal to 21, right? And so now if I wanted to filter my input list with this algorithm, I could use the is of age predicate. And none of my input values right now are uh, greater than or equal to 21, right? So I get a null result, an empty list. But if I added some values like 21, 20, 22, 23, Notice we just implemented that complete, uh, the same logic that we applied in a previous lecture for the bouncer algorithm. And all we needed to do was write a predicate for the specific logic that we used to filter our inputs down uh, as long as they passed this criteria, right? We didn't have to go rewrite a brand new filtering function in order to do that. Once we have a filter in our pocket, we can reuse it and only plug in just the specific criteria we want in order for us to solve the problem we're trying to solve. This is a really powerful tool that allows us to solve much more substantial problems and more significant problems at a higher level of abstraction that allows us to think more about the problem we're trying to solve and less about the process that we expect the computer to follow as it moves through the sequence of steps it needs to do in order to solve it.